Hi, I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you are watching PBS Books. Thank you for joining us this evening. PBS Books, in collaboration with WTTW in Chicago, is pleased to host a conversation with author Dr. Kate Clifford Larson in celebration of the 2022 Library of Congress National Book Festival. PBS Books is proud to partner with the Library of Congress to promote their 2022 National Book Festival, let's take a moment to hear from the Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. Books bring us together as the Library of Congress National Book Festival returns in person on September 3rd at the Washington Convention Center. The festival is free for readers of all ages. We will also be live streaming three stages for audiences across the country. Featured authors this year include Janelle Monet, Leslie Jordan, Niall DeMarco, Nick Offerman, Angie Thomas, and more. So go to loc.gov slash bookfest for more. Thank you. Well, what a lineup. If you are able to travel to Washington, D.C. for September 3rd, which is the Saturday before Labor Day, the festival is occurring between 9 a.m. and 8 p.m., it is free and it is open to everyone. Every year, except the last two years, hundreds of thousands of people gather in Washington, D.C. for this tremendous celebration and schedule. For the complete schedule of the 2022 Library of Congress National Book Festival, you can go to loc.gov slash bookfest. But if you can't be there in person, don't worry, you can stream it at home in the comfort of your home and you can curate your own experience. Well, now through August 31st, PBS Books and PBS stations across the country are hosting a series of 10 virtual events with 11 authors. This is the fourth in the series. I'm sorry, this is the third in the series. They will also be available on demand on PBS Books and the National Book Festival website. Well, today's conversation, as I mentioned, focuses on Kate Clifford Larson and her latest book, a biography, Walk With Me, a biography on Fannie Lou Hamer. During this conversation, we'll discuss her work and the process. It's also exciting because it is said that this is one of the most complete biographies of Fannie Lou Hamer that exists. Let's take a moment to hear from our partner from WTTW. Hey, Tim. Hello, Heather Marie. How are you? Good. So Tim Russell is joining us, and we would love to give you a moment to, to welcome everyone in Chicago and beyond. Thank you, Heather Marie. And I'm so thrilled to be here to talk about the importance of this event for WTTW and PBS. I not only want to welcome the Chicago community for joining us today, but also welcome viewers nationwide. I'm honored to be part of this event that gives all viewers an inside look into the thoughts and ideas of some of the most well-renowned authors. WTTW's purpose is to enrich lives, engage communities, and inspire exploration. Our programming and content across all of our platforms expresses this purpose and today's event with PBS Books and the Library of Congress National Book Festival is the perfect example of WTTW bringing its purpose to life. If you were to compile a list of the great civil rights social activists of our times, Fannie Lou Hamer must be on that list. As a kid growing up at Mount Zion Baptist Church in Oberlin, Ohio, we often sung Fanny's song, better known as This Little Light of Mine. As the story goes, civil rights leader Fanny Lou Hamer was arrested for trying to register to vote. As she was being detained, she began to sing This Little Light of Mine. It would later be sung as civil rights leaders march in peaceful protest, demonstrating their willingness to let their light for freedom and justice shine and thereby bringing about change for the good of all. WTTW is honored to be part of today's conversation with Kate Clifford Larson, who offer an inspirational account of Fannie Lou Hamer's contribution to local and national issues 
around food insecurity, race and gender inequality, and social justice. Today's discussion is critically important as we deal with the issues of race, gender, and culture. We must leverage the strength of our communities to combat historical disparities. We must find that little light like Fannie Lou Hamer. I hope you enjoy today's conversation. Thanks, Tim, and thank you for those inspirational remarks. Well, we would be remiss if we did not thank our library partners across the country, more than 1,800 strong, as well as numerous PBS stations who share this important content with all of you. But most importantly, we'd like to thank all of you for joining us. Now, today's conversation, we will accept live questions. So at the end of the conversation, hopefully there'll be time, but don't forget to get your questions for Kate in the chat early. They will be fed to us and we'll be asking Kate them throughout the conversation, but more towards the latter half of the conversation. Well, the moment you've been waiting for, it is my pleasure to introduce Kate Clifford Larson. Kate Clifford Larson is a best-selling author of acclaimed biographies, including Bound for the Promised Land, Harriet Tubman, Portrait of an American Hero, Rosemary, the Hidden Kennedy Daughter, and the Assassin's Complice, Mary Surratt, and the Plot to Kill Abraham Lincoln. Larson has a BA and an MA from Simmons University, an MBA from Northeastern University, and a doctorate from the University of New Hampshire. She has appeared in national and international media. Larson is an award-winning consultant for feature films, documentaries, state and national parks, heritage, tourism, and more. She is currently a Brand Brandeis University Women's Study Research Center visiting scholar and lives with her family outside of Boston. This we are here to discuss is Larson's latest book, Walk With Me, a biography of Fannie Lou Hamer. It was named one of Kirkus's Review's Best of 2021 and is featured this year, as you all know, at the 2022 National Book Festival. Welcome, Kate. Thank you, Heather Marie. It's great to be here. And hello, Tim. And I'm looking forward to this program. I'm very excited to talk about Fannie Lou Hamer, one of my favorite Americans. Oh, we're so excited to have you um, and to co-moderate the conversation. It's my pleasure actually to invite back in Tim Russell from WTTW. Thank you, Heather Thank you. Marie. So Tim, we've been working on promoting the Library of Congress National Book Festival for the last few years uh, since it went virtual or aspects went vir virtual in 2020. Um, and so I was wondering, on September 3rd, will you be in DC or will you be streaming home from Chicagoland? I will be streaming from uh, Chicago, from my uh, home watching uh, the Library of Congress National Book Festival. I'm excited about it. The diversity of the, of the authors and the diversity of the stories that they're sharing is top notch. It is incredible. And I think every year they're able to put together such an amazing roster. Um, this year, there is no exception to that. And, I, and I'm always so pleased that who we're able to speak with as we, we partner with WTTW. So without further, you know, making the audience wait any longer, why don't we bring in Kate and start asking the questions. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so we are obviously here to discuss your latest book. Mm -hmm. um, it came out almost a year ago, not quite. Okay. Um, can you give us, in your own words, a short summary? Not everyone's read your book, but what can readers expect to find in this, this very special book? They're going to find a remarkable story of a young Black woman who emerged out of the Mississippi Delta uh, living in great poverty and um, oppression. And she rose up out of that soil, that place of tremendous uh, racial violence and discrimination to challenge the, the national leaders on civil rights during the 1960s and the president of the United States at the time, Lyndon Johnson. 
And her voice, her singing voice, her speeches, her passion really shook the nation and changed the course of the civil rights movement as far as I'm concerned. And her legacy lives on today in communities across the, uh, the country who are still fighting for voting rights and equal rights, civil rights. Um, and that's why we need to keep reminding everybody of Fannie Lou Hamer's journey and to look for those Fannie Lou Hamers that are in our communities today. Thank you, Kate. Uh, so when did you first hear about Fannie Lou Hamer? Uh, can you, and can you tell us a little bit about her? And then in addition, what made you decide to write this book? So I learned about Fannie Lou Hamer back in the 1990s. I decided to go back to school to get a degree in uh, women's history and African-American history. And I learned about her then. Um, and she sort of captured my imagination um, as the civil rights activist from the 60s and 70s. She died in 1977, very young, 59 years old. But at the time, I was captivated also by uh, Harriet Tubman. And that's what I was researching and writing about was Tubman and doing my dissertation at the University of New Hampshire about her. And when that, when the the Tubman book came out. Um, Hamer was still in the back of my mind, and I've written other books since then. But Hamer was always there. I mean, there was something about her. There's a similarity between Tubman and Hamer, and I just, uh, in the back of my mind, always knew there was a connection there. Um, but after my Rosemary Kennedy book came out in 2015, all of a sudden, Fannie Lou Hamer was like knocking at the front of my brain, not at the back of my head. And so I decided I would better pay attention to this voice that was really becoming overwhelming. And I started to research her life and decided I needed to write about her. But I did not know at the time how important her life story would be to remind us today of that fight for civil rights and voting rights during the 1960s that she was a big part of. Because as the, you know, 19, I mean, uh, 2016 um, election season in, came to fruition and then, you know, the four years after that and up till today, the issue of voting rights is crucial once more, just like it was in the 1960s. And so I, it was kind of like she knew I needed to, to do this and my, my whole soul and brain was involved in researching and writing about her remarkable life to change the world back in the 1960s. No, and so, you know, you mentioned the similarities between uh, Harriet Tubman and uh, Fannie Lou Hamer. Can you speak to that just a little bit about what were some of the similarities for those of us uh, who are interviewing and then the audience may not know, be aware of. Right. So, you know, Harriet Tubman was born enslaved, struggled as an enslaved person to make her way and survive on the Eastern shore of Maryland. Um, she did, was not formally educated. She liberated herself in before the Civil War. And when she reached free soil, she determined she would go back and free her family and friends. Um, it wasn't just about her, it was about the community. And so that's very much like Fannie Lou Hamer. You know, Tubman became an advocate for freedom and equality and justice and self-determination. She was driven by her faith, driven by, by her family and her love of community. And these are all the values that, that Fannie Lou Hamer had. She struggled in a uh, it wasn't slavery, but it was, you know, it was servitude in many ways on the Delta and the Mississippi picking cotton. And she was not, she had very little education. She dropped out of school in sixth grade. Um, but she had this passion for her family and her faith and the community and what was right and wrong. And so when she became an adult woman, she reached a couple of crossroads, just like Tubman did, her choice to race for freedom or stay with her family. And, and Fannie Lou Hamer did the same thing. She had some choices and she chose to fight for, the, for her family, her community, bolstered by her faith. And because of that, she really changed the nation and the way we look at the civil rights movement today. 
The story is so incredible and, and we're looking to hear a little more about this story in a bit, but I was hoping we could touch a little bit on process. So your book, as someone who um, loves nonfiction, um, I was wondering how long it took you to write this book. And then I also wanted to note that I noticed that there's about 60 pages of biography <laughs> and notes clarification, which for those of you who maybe are intimidated by this big book, don't be as intimidated as you think because it it is big, it is hefty, it needs to be because Fannie Lou Hamer is is a big deal, right? Mm -hmm. And you're gonna get the, the best account of Fannie Lou Hamer. But I'm interested in and kind of if you could share a little bit about your research process and how long it took to start. So it took me um, about four and a half years, um, closing in on five years to research and write about her. And um, I, I read, there were other bi biographies of her out there that were written in the 1990s and early 2000s. And, but since then there have been a lot of, um, collections of papers and documents related to her life and the organization she was involved with that have been gifted to universities and other archives. So I benefited from those records. And also when the National Museum of African American History and Culture was established in Washington, DC, um, they started interviewing some of the civil rights veterans from the 50s and 60s and 70s. And they re-interviewed all these people that worked with Fannie Lou Hamer. So it was a fresh collection of memories of her so between all those new documents and the FBI files, um, they, the FBI followed her, they kept records on her, all the people she related with and interacted with FBI files. So I had the benefit of those records that other biographers did not have. So it opened up a world of Fannie Lou Hamer, the woman, and the context of her life and the people that she was involved in. And so to put Fannie Lou Hamer at the center of the civil rights story was my goal. Because for me, that's how I look at history. How does the ordinary person who ends up actually doing extraordinary things, how do they live and exist in these incredible moments in our American collective history? And Fannie Lou Hamer was an amazing person in that moment. And it allowed me to deliver that story of the civil rights movement but through Fannie Lou Hamer as a, a pivotal, important person that changed the trajectory of the movement at the time. And she was an ordinary person, not just some, uh, Martin Luther King did amazing things. Rosa Parks did amazing things, but Fannie Lou Hamer was a sharecropper in Mississippi with little education. How did she change things? Oh, in a big way, in a way that Martin Luther King could not or Rosa Parks. And so that was what really drove me to write her story. I couldn't, I couldn't stop. I just, I had to get every detail of her life and explain how this incredible child, teenager woman rose up out of that dirt in Mississippi Delta and became such a catalyst for change in our country. I mean, I think in your book, it says she was the 20th child Right. I mean, when I read that, I just was like, oh my gosh, right? Just even, there's a lot there, just even knowing that. Um, as you did all of this research, did you have a favorite library? I'm sure you had many favorites. What was one you would share um, in terms of that stuck out to you in terms of a library or an archive that that really helped you to to find something, some little bit of information that was just, you didn't expect. So um, there are there are so many digitized archives now. Um, so of course the Library of Congress has some information. Um, the Smithsonian Institute has um, recordings of her speeches and her the rallies that she attended, especially when she was very um, just emerging in the movement, and she would sing to calm a, car, a, cl a crowd down and get them, and then get them all excited in the rally. Um, and then there's the Wisconsin Historical Society that has an amazing collection of civil rights um, activist uh, papers, and uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And then there's um, you know, the Martin Luther King um, Center has collected many of the civil rights 
archives and um, many of the papers of the organizations that, that uh, Fannie Lou Hamer was involved in. So I would benefited from all of those. And I have to give a shout out to librarians and archivists across the country during the pandemic when a lot of those places were closed and they continued to work. And I would request, I just plead, and often I, at times I didn't have to plead, can I get a digitized copy of such and such? And they would do that. It was just, it was because I couldn't travel to those archives. So those archivists and librarians went above and beyond to help me as a scholar. And I, I'm imagining they did it for other scholars too. They did a, the lion's share of um, getting the resources I needed to write this book. I mean, the, the, the book, Kate, is, is fascinating. And just the way that you, you know, kind of describe Fannie Lou Hamer's life throughout the book. Did you happen to interview or talk with people that knew Fannie Lou Hamer? Uh, and what were those conversations like? Because my assumption is, is that Fannie Lou Hamer was an ordinary person, as you mentioned, who did this extraordinary thing, you know, fighting for civil rights and voting rights. And then so my assumption is that her friends and the people that knew her were probably also ordinary people. And so when you approached them, what was it like um, interviewing them? And is there a, a story of one in particular uh, that you would love to share? Oh, there are so many stories, but of course, interviewing the people that knew her, I was like, you know, they, they are rock stars to me that they knew Fannie Lou Hamer. But when I interviewed them, I cannot express that feeling, but the, the sound in their voices when they talked about Fannie Lou Hamer, they still, now they're in their 70s and 80s now, and they still have that feeling that when they first met her, that they were in awe of her. And some of them were young students when they met her for the first time, and she would like speak to them and encourage them to be part of the civil rights movement. And even today at 80 years old, some of them are like, you know, she, she rocked my world, she changed me. And their voices change when they start talking about her and they get very emotional talking about her. Um, so that was quite an experience for me. I did not expect that. Um, and so uh, I, I hope that comes across in my book when I quote them talking about Hamer and their experiences with her. So there are a couple of, of uh, conversations that I had with a, a few people that, um, I mean, all the conversations were amazing and they told me incredible stories. And there was one that talked about, so she was incredibly famous um, after 1964 when she you know, was on the national stage. And so everybody you know, just idolized her in the civil rights movement. And some of these young people who met her later in the later 1960s and early 70s, they'd go to her home in Ruleville, Mississippi. And one of two of these young people um, were lawyers, young lawyers, just on their first kind of community activist lawyer jobs. And they went to meet her and they went on their porch. They're sitting at their, on their porch, on her porch with the, her. And they're talking to her, interviewing her. And both of these lawyers I talked to said they have very little memory of what they talked about because they were so in awe of sitting on the porch with Fannie Lou Hamer. And they remember that her granddaughter was in the yard, digging in the yard, playing with something. And Fannie Lou Hamer, you know, just checked on her granddaughter a few times. And then they were talking to her and she said, oh, I, I got this, the key to the city of, I think it was Cincinnati. And the two young lawyers are like, really, can we see the key to the city of Cincinnati? And she said, sure. She called over her granddaughter who was using the key to dig in the front yard. And <laughs> they just were like, oh my gosh, she's just so not affected by the fame and the, all the things that, you know, it's just, it's just something else. But her goal and the reason those lawyers were there were to help community people who were struggling against foreclosures on their mortgages or they were getting their furniture repossessed because they couldn't make the next payment. So that taught them a huge les lesson about humility and also fame and the importance of keeping your eye on the prize, on your goal. You have work to do, keep doing it. And those keys to the city are not necessarily the be all and end all. Yeah, you know, I mean, Kate, one of the great things about this book was I think an ordinary person uh, or a re you know, regular individual would have probably quit 
at some point throughout, you know, this journey. But um, what was kept coming through was uh, Fannie Lou Hamer's uh, perseverance and her unwavering voice for change. You know, can you talk a little bit about that and what we can learn from that, from, from her, her perseverance? So Fannie Lou Hamer was living her life as a sharecropper in Mississippi, and it wasn't a great life, but it was a life like many of, you know, thousands of people in Mississippi doing the same thing. But she reached a couple of crossroads in her life. One was um, she was uh, sterilized without her permission when she was in her early 40s. And um, she was hoping to have surgery to take care of some fibroid tumors that were preventing her from getting pregnant. And the doctor just sterilized her and never told her. She found out from the cook on the plantation that she was a sharecropper in, that she had been sterilized. And that sent her into a deep depression and she questioned her profound faith. And she, she says that she said to God, what are you doing? Why, what is, what is this all about? I, I, you know, and she really struggled with her faith and her belief in humanity and her faith really elevated her and supported her. It was her foundation. And she came out of that crossroads determined to make a difference in her life and the lives of other black women and sharecroppers in Mississippi. And that, so that's the really important thing about Hamer. She had this foundation that even though she questioned her faith, it always stood strong for her. And that's what she returned to time and time again, when she faced down the violence, the discrimination, the, the threats, the, the horrific conditions, she had to keep going. She did not stop because she felt that she had a moral um, directive from God, from humanity to, to make a change. And that was her source of strength, just like Harriet Tubman, the same kind of faith that never wavered. Um, and Fannie Lou Hamer just returned to her faith repeatedly so she'd have the strength to carry on. Well, for those of you who are just joining us, I'm Heather Marie Montier. You, you are watching PBS Books. I'm here with my colleague, Tim Russell from WTTW, and we are talking with Kate Clifford Larson about her latest book released in 2021, a biography about Fannie Lou Hamer. And I will show you because it is such a gorgeous book. Walk with me. So back to the conversation and Tim, over to you. Thank you, uh, Kate. I'm like really enjoying this conversation and I can uh, feel your passion for Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, you know, there also in the book, there's this uh, searing anger and pain on the pages of this book, particularly reading the abuse Hamer faced by police uh, mm -hmm. after her arrest in Mississippi. The chapter is particularly difficult to read how hard was it to write? So that is the chapter about her arrest and um, incarceration uh, over a few days in Winona, Mississippi. And she was, along with other civil rights activists, she was brutally beaten and she personally was sexually assaulted. It was very, I, I, it's very vivid chapter and I struggled with writing that. Um, but at the time that I wrote that, I was then a... Um, a visiting scholar at the Brandeis Women's Studies Research Center. And I had a, a group of women that were reading the chapters. And so I worked the chapter through with them. And the, the Me Too movement had happened since I started the book. And I decided that I needed to tell Fannie Lou Hamer's story, the truth of it, because she didn't really talk about it in public. But I thought if she were alive in, in 2020, she would tell the truth of what had happened to her. So I felt an obligation to write it, but it was very, very difficult as a woman to write those scenes in that jail. Um, but the women at Brandeis helped me work through it. And um, I think that it's an important statement and I hope that it gave voice to Hamer who really was not comfortable talking about all of that in public. Kate, thank you for sharing that. And I feel, um... It's, I struggle often when I read chapters like that to think about what the author must have gone through as well as they uncover and as they deal and think about their own mental health. So it's mm. in some way, it's never nice to have to, but it's yeah. wonderful that you had such a supportive community to be able yeah. to 
that. Um, our, our next question is, when I think of Fannie Lou Hamer, I really, I, I do think, I think about her courage and her conviction and her belief that she could change people's minds, their hearts, uh, when people observed injustice. And then I look to today and I think of everything we've been through in the last even five years, right? Mm -hmm. The Me Too movement, we think about uh, the Black Lives Matter, we think about everything that's happened, even the inequities in how healthcare has been mm -hmm. handed out. And I can't help but wonder what you think Fannie Lou Hamer would think today. Uh, so I, I think on the one hand, I think she would not be surprised that um, we are still struggling with these issues today. On the other hand, when she died, uh, even though she was struggling at the time that she died, things were better in her world. You know, voting rights had improved, et cetera. So there's part of me that says she would be shocked at the rapid reversal that has happened um, in the status of, of women's health care, particularly women's, uh, Black women's health care. Uh, Serena Williams is an example who is out there advocating for more resources and to change attitudes about the treatment of Black women in, in healthcare. Um, and, you know, voting rights, it's, this is, we're talking about this every single day. I think that would probably trouble Fannie Lou Hamer the most, that she had struggled so much to make change. And there was tremendous change in Mississippi and across the country. But clearly it wasn't enough because we're still dealing with this more than 50 years later. Hmm. Thank you, Kate. And I, and I have a, a two-part question for you. Uh, first is, what you, you touched on this uh, somewhat, but what do you think would be Fannie's uh, biggest legacy, her, her biggest legacy is today? And then uh, what is a takeaway you would love for people to take away from reading your book? If there was one thing that they, that you would say that I was hoping to get across, what would that be? So that's so mean, one thing. <laughs> you know, Fannie Lou Hamer would go on for an hour right now. <laughs> um, she would, it, 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 for her, it was all about voting because you can't make change if you, can't, you don't get out and vote. Mm. So that's her big, that would be her big message. If, if you can vote, vote. If you don't, haven't registered, register to vote. Do it and make sure that your vote counts. Um, that would be her big message. But the other thing is that Fannie Lou Hamer for me represents so much that oftentimes I think we forget because of our media, we pay attention to a lot of the national figures. But in our communities today, there are Fannie Lou Hamers and they are, they are strong and they are amazing and they have incredible messages and they are doing the work every single day. And they need our support. So we need to identify the Fannie Lou Hamers today and support them, whether it's, you know, in your, your town, city, county, uh, district, you know, state, whatever. You need to find them. We need to find them because we all can't be leaders like Fannie Lou Hamer. But we don't have to look at the leaders that have the elite educations. They have all the financial resources you know, they're going to do fine, but the Fannie Lou Hamers don't have those assets, but we can be the assets and we can elevate them and support them. And that's what happened to Fannie Lou Hamer. And that was the, she got that support, which catapulted her to the national stage. And she made a difference because Americans around the country recognized her in themselves. And that motivated them to register to vote, to go and vote and to make change in this country in the 1960s. Uh, you know, Kate, we at WTTW, we did a Chicago stories on um, Ida B. Wells. And, mm -hmm. you know, as I was reading the book and you mentioned Harriet Tubman and that should have and she should have popped in my mind as I was reading it, too. But, you know, I saw that through line oh, from yeah. Ida B. Wells to uh, Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, and then so if we look at today and, uh, you know, about. Who do you think is that, or are there people that you would say is that next through line uh, to Fannie Lou Hamer? So 
you know, on the national stage, everybody recognizes uh, Stacey Abrams. Um, but behind Stacey Abrams are those women in all those communities and men across the country that are supporting a Stacey Abrams. And I think of the civil rights activists that I interviewed that are now in their 70s and 80s. They're still active. They haven't stopped. They're out there. They're campaigning. They're raising money. They are giving speeches. They are reminding people you have to keep working because it isn't a given. You know, the Civil Rights Act was passed uh, in 1965, um, uh, the, the Civil Rights Act that was passed by Lyndon Johnson. Well, now that act is being whittled away by um, the Supreme Court. So those civil rights activists from the 60s are reactivated and they are out there telling us, you have to keep fighting that civil rights act cannot be dismantled. So look for those activists in your community, join with them because they are really gifted and they are adept at identifying the younger generations that are rising up and they, those young people that have the power and the passion and the ability to reach a nation. So we need to look for those in our communities today, everywhere. So I encourage that you know, now in honor of Fannie Lou Hamer. She would say the same thing. She would absolutely say that. Thank you. Well, we've been having lots of questions come in on our Facebook feed. So the first one I'm going to ask, actually, because it's the second question she's asked, Erica M. Brooks wrote, what was the deepest and most profound moments you encountered that will always forever express this Black woman's struggles on behalf of all Black women? <laughs> oh, my God. Here we go with one profound <laughs> moment, because there were so many. Uh, you know, um, Fannie Lou Hamer didn't always just only struggle for voting rights. She struggled for access to um, food and housing and health care. You know, she was sterilized without her permission. She became a fierce advocate for control over women's bodies. Although later in her life, she became conservative and was anti-abortion. It was a result of what had happened to her. Um, and also she recognized that women carried such a tremendous load in communities, um, black and white women or women of all colors, but particularly black women, and that they bore the brunt of a lot of the discrimination and violence as well. And so I, that moved me tremendously that a woman like Fannie Lou Hamer, who, who could have chosen after she was sterilized, after she was beaten and, and assaulted, sexually assaulted in the jail, she could have gone home and done nothing. But she stood up in the tradition of many Black women before her and with her and since her, her, her life to stand up and keep fighting at great risk to themselves. And so I, that is what I, I found incredibly profound. There are women like that that have moved this country forward and we need to recognize them. And so at the beginning of this program, I think it was uh, Heather Marie that mentioned how so few people recognize Fannie Lou Hamer's name today. We all should be recognizing Fannie Lou Hamer and other women like her. There are many that she was colleagues with who did amazing things. Anne and Ida B. Wells Barnett, Anna Harriet Tubman and many, many others because they were all ordinary women at one time and they rose up to change a wor the world and we can do the same today. I actually have a follow-up question. So exactly what you said, ordinary women, and, I, and I'm gonna point to you for a second, right? Because you are a trailblazer in, in such a way because you're writing, you're in this space. And I just wanna say, it's unconventional. You have an MBA, right? You have a PhD, but you have an MBA and you are in this space where you're writing about these, almost uncovering these stories of trailblazing women. Most people have heard of Harriet Tubman, I, I would say at this point, and, and, I, and I hope you're going to talk a little more about that in a few minutes. But how did you end up in this space of, of saying, I want to make sure that the whole world, I'm going to amplify the voices of, of women who have maybe not gotten the time and and the 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 attention they needed how did you how did you get there from going to business school 
to, <laughs> to finding this, this amazing space and making such a difference in so many people's lives by, by sharing? Um, two things. One is uh, business school uh, was a little bit of a struggle. I remember having a, 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 a professor who was teaching this, um, this class on investment banking. And he told the students the first day of class that all the women in the, in the class should leave because investment banking was no place for women. So that was a problem. And, and I was determined I was going to stay in that class because I wasn't going to take that. And then um, when I was, I did have a job for, with an investment bank and we would go to meetings and, and I would be asked to take the notes all the time, even though I might be the expert on the industry that we were, you know, we were visiting a certain company. And that kind of taught me something and I needed to know why was this bothering me so much and what could I do about it? At the same time, I really, I read a lot of books about women in history and I just, one day it clicked and I decided I needed to move forward and do something about it. And that's why I went back to school to get my degree in women's history. And African-American history happened. It was a coincidence, but it, it did. And I'm, it's just, it was magic for me. So I pursued it. And I knew that there were lives and stories that I, I needed to tell. I just, I just can't help it. And, and I hope I continue this till I'm, you know, 100 years old. <laughs> So, Kate, it's been almost two decades uh, since you pr published Bound for the Promised Land, Harriet Tubman, Portrait of an American Hero. Um, as you're aware, and I hope our audience is aware, PBS will be uh, airing uh, a new documentary on ha uh, Harriet Tubman uh, this October. You know, are you involved in this in the documentary anyway? Yes, I was part of the advisory committee and consulting on the film, so it would be historically accurate. And it's a beautiful film, and um, it's called Harriet Tubman, Visions of Freedom, and it premieres October 4th on PBS. Perfect. And can I follow up with a question? This is actually a uh, based off of Erica had asked another question in the, in the chat about, uh, her question is, if you could speak to Fannie Lou Hamer today, what would you want her to know? But I want to add a little twist to it. If you could speak to Fannie Lou Hamer today, uh, and you were telling her you're writing an autobiography, what one question would you, that one again, would you have wanted to ask her personally about her life? Oh, are you kidding? One question? <laughs> okay, are I'll give you kidding? two. <laughs> How about a hundred? <laughs> uh, I, you know, even though I write about her courage and how her faith is the foundation of that courage and her determination. I'd want to hear it from her. I want it, I would like to hear her voice. I'd want her to tell me, how did she rise up after being sterilized without her permission? How did she pull herself together after that assault in the jail and carry on? How did she do that? I, I, I just would like to hear her talk about it. Um, so, yeah, that's what I would want to know, along with about 98 other questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, the Library of Congress, so that's what brings us together. Um, and I was hoping if you could share a little bit, is this your first time going? Are you looking forward to it? We know what you're going to be talking about, at least some of what you're going to be talking about. Um, can you share anything? Give us like a little hint so um, I've never been, and I'm excited to go and also be a featured author. And I will be um, doing a, uh, an, a conversation on stage um, with another amazing author and her book about civil rights activist Constance Baker Motley, uh, Tamiko Brown Nagan. I'm just going to show her book here. So we are going to be in conversation on stage talking about these, you know, Fannie Lou Hamer and uh, Constance Baker Motley. And I think it's going to be an amazing conversation. And I hope everybody will come and listen and ask questions and celebrate these amazing women that were trailblazers that have brought us to this moment and this moment where we need to rise up and, and in their, their spirit and with their legacy, carry on their work. Well, we're so excited that you are involved with, 
with the Library of Congress National Book Festival this year, you were in for quite the treat. Um, I always, the first time I went was in 2019. And I will tell you two things. One is plan your agenda. Yes, you're going to be busy. You're going to have this conversation. I went there for work as well, but I was so busy and I couldn't like, I looked at the schedule and there are going to be multiple things you want to do at the same time. So plan ahead and like knock it out. And if not, the good news is you can get all the content later because yes, this, the three stages are being live streamed, but all the other content mm -hmm. will be available within two weeks. It'll be rolled out. So that's great news for you. That did not happen in 2019. So yay. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, and the other is, it's incredible. You will meet even like waiting online or walking around the most amazing people. And they're all curious, right? They're all people like us. They're, they're every walk of life. And they are just, it's just a great feeling to look around and be like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. And so um, I will say that it is something everyone should do. Um, and it's just re a really special experience. And I just think that everyone is going to be so fortunate to be able to to, to hear you speak and delve more into the details of your book. Yeah. Um, and, and we are so, we feel so fortunate. Before I close the show, Tim, do you have any last question? You have been giving all these hard questions to Kate. And uh, <laughs> one more question for you. That's all you get, Tim, one. <laughs> okay, well, I, I think this would be a, uh, a, a, a simple one. Uh, you know, are you currently writing anything? And if so, what is it? Can you share? I, as a I, I'm, I can't share. Uh, <laughs> we, were hoping, we were hoping to get no, some breaking news. Yeah, I can't, I can't. <laughs> but I mean, I'm sure whatever uh, you're writing is going to be uh, one of those, you know, a, another book that really, you know, forces us to look at ourselves um, as well as the the person that you're you're writing about. I will say that for me, while, you know, reading Walk With Me, it, you know, forced me to like, it forced me also to look at what I'm doing and mm -hmm. how I'm participating. And so for me, that's the takeaway. And I hope that those who read it also can uh, do some self-reflection. So uh, Kate, thank you so much. This has been an honor of mine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim and Heather Marie. This has been fantastic. Thank you. It's really been so much fun. And Tim, thank you for being my partner in crime in this interview. It's been really thank fun you. to have you. We love to partner with WTTW and to big shout out to the Chicago community. Um, and just don't forget to stream if you can't be there in person. And don't forget to stop by the talk that Kate Clifford Larson is giving. So... Um, it's time to close the program. I want to remind everyone that the Library of Congress National Book Festival happens on September 3rd between 9 a.m. 8 p.m. Leading up to the Library of Congress National Book Festival, we are doing, PBS Books is doing a series of 10 virtual programs to promote uh, the book festival. And we are so lucky to be able to, to speak with amazing authors like Kate um, and to talk to them about their work and also their experiences and um, at the Library of Congress National Book Festival and what we can expect. So don't forget to tune in um, on tomorrow night uh, for, we'll be speaking with Geraldine Brooks, um, but it will be at 6 p.m. If you join at eight, you'll still get to see it and stream it, but it will start at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard. Until next time, until tomorrow, I'm Heather Marie Montilla. You're watching PBS Books. Happy reading.